Okay, good morning, everybody. And uh, as the other speaker said, it's great to be here with you today. Um, there's, I'm looking at the agenda, there's a huge diversity of, uh, of topics that I think you, you people are interested in. Um, and uh, I'm, not, I'm going to talk about wireless, yes, but actually what we're going to be doing with wireless uh, over the next 10, 20, 20 years or so. Just um, a few words of introduction about myself. How does this one work? Okay. All right, okay. So I, I was amongst the three or four or five hands that went up when uh, the previous speaker asked uh, who's here from industry. Uh, so I've spent the last nearly 30 years, um, uh, originally the background in computer science, uh, working in technology businesses to uh, bring technology to market to do things that change lives. Uh, and a lot of that time has been in the mobile phone industry. Uh, way back from the very first digital phones uh, in, the, in the 90s, uh, all the way through to the smartphone generation. I was with Qualcomm uh, until earlier this year, but I've recently joined a 10-person uh, startup called IOTIC Labs, which is in the Internet of Things space. Uh, and because this is a knowledge talk and I'm supposed to talk about something I know something about, uh, <laughs> then I'm going to focus on uh, the Internet of Things as an aspect of the future of wireless. I'm here wearing two hats, a bit like our previous speaker. So uh, I'm with IOTIC Labs. Uh, I'm also a board member of uh, Cambridge Wireless, or CW. CW is a, is a networking organization. Get used to how to use this thing. Um, based here in the UK, but really with an international reach. Uh, it's representing over 400 organizations and members now. Anyone can join as a member. We have a mixture of the big companies and the small companies. Uh, we have a mixture of uh, uh, industry players and uh, academic players. And it's really a meeting place uh, for people to come together and, and share ideas. We run events a, a bit like this, uh, and we run an event roughly once a week. We run 50-odd events a year, um, mostly in the UK, London, Cambridge, Bath, Bristol, Birmingham, all those sorts of places. Uh, but increasingly, we're moving to become a virtual network. So if you're from overseas, uh, I would uh, encourage you to think about joining the organization. I want to really um, suggest two things to you in this, in this short talk. The first is that the Internet of Things uh, is a massively big thing, bigger, bigger than even putting the word Internet and lots of things together uh, could possibly uh, imply. Uh, and it's a, it's a massively exciting area. Uh, one that I'd like to encourage you to point your research towards. Um, and I'd also like to suggest that industry and academia are talking more together and, and learning how to work together. We've heard uh, in the previous talks about con consortia uh, with, uh, with EU and other sorts of funding, uh, where really we bring together academic partners, uh, some big businesses, some small businesses like my own, uh, and maybe some, some beneficiaries uh, so in the case of, of a future city, it might be uh, a, a local city, for example. So it's just you two things. The Internet of Things is, is bigger than you could possibly imagine. Uh, and, and secondly, um, to come and work together between industry and academia to, to really um, make this come into being. Uh, and the Internet of Things um, is bigger than humanity, potentially. Well, certainly from a pure numbers point of view, uh, yeah, we have six billion plus uh, mobile connections now, uh, and there are predictions that are all over the place, but uh, 50 billion is, is one number that's, that's out there in terms of the number of connected devices, connected things that we might have by 2020. It doesn't really matter what that number is, it's going to be a big number. Uh, it's going to be bigger than the number, number of humans on the planet. Uh, and, and in fact, I looked at, looked at one of the stats, even back in 2008 was the point where we reached the point where there were more connected things uh, than there were connected people. So we're already into this very beginnings of this Internet of Things uh, phenomena. And we like to liken it a bit to the Industrial Revolution, um, which um, was formed from lots of uh, disparate activity, different people doing different things in different places, not necessarily having a big grand vision, uh, but things began to connect together and, and to make sense. Uh, there were lots of unexpected outcomes in terms of transformation uh, in, in manufacturing, uh, in transportation, in the movement of goods and services around, in the displacement of people, the growth of cities, there are all kinds of things that, that, that happened through the Industrial Re Revolution, none of which could have been predicted 
uh, by anybody, I don't think, at the beginning of that. Um, and it had the effect of transforming economies, transforming businesses, transforming society, transforming individuals' lives. And my assertion is that the Internet of Things is like that. Okay? We haven't quite got there yet, but it's, 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 it's going to be like that. It's going to be on such a scale. It's going to transform how we, how we run our lives, how we look after ourselves and, and our health and our well-being throughout our lives, how we get around places... Uh, you know, how, we, how we interact with goods and services around us, uh, and so on. Um, and um, anyone can say they're an expert and, and would all be wrong in terms of what impacts this will have. But I, I'm sufficiently confident that it's going to be very large. I've just started reading a book about the history of uh, the Industrial Revolution to kind of gain some more uh, kind of insights into, into what happened there. And I picked up a book I uh, just started reading called Iron, Steam and Money by uh, Roger Osborne. And there's a, a reviewer's comment that uh, really drew my eye. It says, the book explains how key technological breakthroughs, such as Abraham Darby's coke fueled blast furnace, led to increased demand for coal, which led in turn to deeper mines, need more coal, which led, in, led to a need for pumping equipment, make sure there's no water in the mines, which led to the new Newcomen engine, which then led to the genius of James Watt, which led to a need for rotary power, which led to factories being liberated from water supplies, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this is kind of just, just one little snapshot on, on the Industrial Revolution. There was a, an upsurge of um, te technological innovation. There were real problems that people were trying to solve. As they tackled those problems, it created new problems and new opportunities, uh, and the whole thing gathered uh, quite a large momentum, maybe over 100 years or more. With the Internet of Things, I think we're looking over the next... 10 plus years, 10, 20 years, yeah. So, uh, so one characteristic is it's going to be much more rapid uh, than anything we've ever seen before. So we're in for a period of disruptive change. The word disruptive can be positive or negative, depending on how you look at it. It changes things that we're used to. It makes things different. Um, but with that, and this is certainly where I'm coming from, is, 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 is my belief that we can, we can make better societies. Yeah? We can make our societies and our cities, our places to live and work, uh, better places to be. I was looking at the, the little post-it notes about if I had a robot, what would I like it to do? And there's all kinds of things there about helping me do the, do the, uh, do the housework and uh, give me a massage and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but there, there was one there which was something along the lines, you know, kind of help, us help people to become more like people, become more human, more, more, more human-like. And I think, what, what does that mean? It means the things that really matter to us uh, our relationships with, with other human beings. It's, it's the emotional and it's the social side of life. So we're all, we all engage our kind of um, logical side of our brains uh, as we engage in, in research and creating technology and products and services. But really we need to see this, I think, from the point of view of building better societies. And that's the frame and the lens uh, very much through which I see this. So what's changing? Um, and I, I should have said, just, just before I, I, I look at this for a moment, that why I entitled this The Future of Wireless, Nothing Like the Past, was for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is Cambridge Wireless runs a big conference uh, once a year, um, which looks at some of the big, big themes uh, in wireless, and it's called The Future of Wireless Conference. Um, and this year we were looking at disruption. So it was that word I put up there a moment ago, disruptive change. What's changing and, and, and what are the discon discontinuities? Uh, and we looked at uh, uh, steamroller effects, big things that are coming, coming our way that are going to have disruptive change. And a lot of things that we're talking about here at this conference in terms of advances in, 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 in computing uh, uh, will drive some of those disruptive changes. Um, so th th there, there were a, a number of things that, that we picked out there. But, but really this, this change from a, a wireless industry focused on connecting people um, to... What on earth does it mean to connect lots of things together? And actually, the, the risk is that from a wireless industry point of view, you focus so much on the connectivity. Yeah, there's huge issues to do that with. We're doing it in low-power low ways, um, you know, over, over limited spectrum, and, and so on and so on. There's huge, really important issues there. Uh, but really, that's just an enabler. OK, so now I've connected it things. Well, what am I going to do with them? Uh, how am I going to transform societies? That's where the real issues arise. So I just listed here, I could have put another 20 things or 50 things uh, on that list quite easily. But some of the things that, that are changing, uh, certainly through the focus of, of the world that I live in. Um, 
and I won't go through them all, but, but it was interesting in, in just putting that list down that I would say that there's a transition gradually from things that are more physical, hardware, things you can knock, touch, uh, like networks and network hardware and, and so on, and products and things, things that are tangible, uh, and, and a focus around people uh, interacting with other people. Um, and moving, there's a general trend there, I think, moving towards things being more virtual. So uh, I'm not in the network world, but if you're in the network world, it's all about virtualized networks at the moment. That's a big, big, big topic at the moment. Um, it's just, you know, just a piece of software in the cloud somewhere at the end of the day. Um, and um, you know, we're, we're moving from being able to control machines to machines being able to make decisions uh, on, the, on, their, on our behalf, hopefully, um, but without our intervention. Uh, a lot of, lot of movement from um, augmenting the real world that we live in through some overlay uh, of computing. There's all the stuff about glasses and so on around that. Um, so there is a trend here to say that actually we can do some in more interesting things if we can virtualize um, real world objects or real world things or real world uh, pieces, of, pieces of equipment. Um, and, and data uh, has become or is becoming the new uh, raw material uh, of this information revolution. Um, and uh, we were talking to somebody in the rail industry recently who's collecting lots of data uh, about, about just a piece of track, effectively, and trains that are running on it. Um, and uh, they were collecting terabytes of data um, it, just within a matter of days. And uh, the guy said, you know, when you've got that much data, you haven't got, you haven't got data, you've got noise. You know, it's just, just uh, what are you going to do with all that data? So as, shall we say, as computer scientists, uh, if I can use that, that general term, you know, actually di discerning knowledge, information, meaning uh, from data becomes a really, a really key thing. So, internet of all sorts of things. So, what, what, is, what is internet? You know, it allows us to connect, connect computers together and, and, and humans together. And what is a thing? Well, a thing can be absolutely anything, can't it? It can be something that, uh, that is computerized, has, a, has a electronics and software in it today, but it, it might not at the moment. Um, we're going to be talking about every day, you know, every, my, my shoes will become internet enabled. Um, Wow, you know, so, so we need to expand our horizons when we're thinking about what this, what this, what this could mean. Um, and, and so we, we asked some questions. We said, well, so why can't things just be on the internet? Well, they, my shoe can't be on the internet at the moment because it's a, physical, it's a physical object. It's got no connectivity. OK, well, perhaps we can change that. Um, but even if I connect my shoe to the internet, well, how's it going to interact with, any, with anything else? How can it find other, other things? How can it find my trousers and interact with my trousers? And how, how does it know that those trousers belong to me and all that, all that sort of stuff? Um, and do I have to define what, what I want to achieve first and then kind of build a system that, 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 that does that? Uh, or does it need to be more, more organic, more disruptive, kind of more enabling and kind of just, just see what happens when you when you have the opportunity to connect things together. Um, so the thinking step that, uh, that we've taken here is to say, well, actually, if, if you begin to view every physical thing um, as having a virtual equivalent uh, in, in the, let's call it the cloud for the moment, in, in the cloud, then, then maybe these things can interact with each other. So if I had a virtual shoe and it could find my virtual pair of trousers, then maybe they could have a conversation <coughs> together. I don't know why I picked that example. It's the first thing I thought of. Um, <laughs> so if, if we believe it's going to become possible to connect things to the internet, we're going to find ways through, through uh, smart electronics and, and, and communication standards and, and, and new forms of wireless and low-power networks and so on. So let's take that as a presumption. Um, Let's, now, if I can take a virtual, uh, a virtual thing of, of, of things, then I've got effectively com two computer programs, one representing my shoe and one representing my trousers, that perhaps can begin to have a conversation together. So maybe that's a way to begin to uh, achieve the Internet of Things, where things could begin to talk to each other. Now, to do that, you need a kind of a place or a space where these uh, virtual objects can um, uh, talk to each other. Um, it's a bit like Second Life. You know, it's like having a, a kind of a, 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 an alternative reality uh, where uh, you know, I can exist in, in, in another space. So just a very kind of simple example to illustrate that. So imagine I've got my, my water sprinkler and I can turn it on and I can turn it off and it waters the plants. Trouble is it, it rains and 
it waters plants when they don't need to because it's raining. So, okay, so maybe I can get a little timer um, and I can set the timer um, to turn it on and off at certain times. Uh, and then maybe it's a really clever one because I can connect it to my smartphone, uh, maybe via the cloud, uh, and I can use a little app on my phone and I can turn the, turn the sprinkler on and off, which is cool. Uh, and maybe I can set up some rules on there uh, and that's okay, but I still don't know really when to turn it on and when it, off, when, you know, when it actually needs water in. So, okay, so maybe uh, I can connect to the cloud and get some weather, fo weather forecast information. But high computing, high performance computing aside, weather forecasts are still not as good as we'd like them to be all the time. Um, maybe, maybe, what happens if my neighbour uh, has a weather station that's broadcasting information about the micro weather uh, in my vicinity? Well, that would be kind of useful, wouldn't it? Um, I'd have to know it's there, because it's over the hedge, so I might not know it's there. Um, but if I, could, if I could find that thing um, and, and that data was being shared, then, well, maybe there's another way of doing this. Maybe... Um, we can join thing, begin to join things together and say, okay, I'll take the national weather forecast, I'll take the micro weather forecast, uh, and maybe I've got a more accurate uh, way of forecasting when to turn my sprinkler on and when it needs it. Um, so we call this thing the IOTIC space, the, I the IOT space. It's a, it, it's, it's a virtual space in which real world things and some virtual things, because the weather forecast is virtual, if you think about it, uh, can interact together. Then maybe, there's some new things we can do. So maybe this is, this is shown as a, as a person for the moment. Maybe there's some real expertise out there. Um, maybe this is not my grass. Maybe it's my prize roses or something. Yeah? Uh, and, and there's some precision information uh, that, uh, that would say, well, you water it not more than this amount under these weather conditions and not more than this amount under these weather conditions. So maybe now there's an opportunity for some expert to provide me information. Well, maybe that could be provided via a service uh, into this system um, and, and maybe it doesn't need to be that physical human being maybe this can now be a software agent this can be a computer program with some intelligence um, that can amass can, can bring together uh, human wisdom and knowledge uh, and begin to offer that as a service so, so now we have a autonomous potentially an autonomous software agent that can begin to uh, have some influence over when my sprinkler comes on so we call that mash apps. If you can mash data together, it's the kind of the apps and services that you can, you can provide as part of that. So now maybe also, if it's all connected, well actually maybe this is my water company. Maybe my water company uh, would first of all be interested to know when, when I'm watering my plants and actually maybe uh, can do something clever and offer me a special tariff. Uh, you know, if, I, if I'm only watering my plants for when I really need it rather than half an hour a day irrespective of whether it's raining or not. So again, you can begin to see how an ecosystem of value from this very simple example of a water sprinkler can be created. Can, can be created. Now think about if you apply that to um, re, you know, real world issues like healthcare, uh, assistive living. Um, you think about transportation in cities and getting people around and, and, and having trains and buses and planes in the right place at the right time. Uh, you, you, you think about the environmental improvements that we could bring. You can begin to see how you can have a really large, uh, large impact very quickly. So what you land up with is a community of related things. This is a slide um, not from Cambridge Wireless but from uh, Tech UK, which is another uh, organisation in the UK which brings uh, um, uh, companies and businesses together. Um, not going to go into details of the diagram, but what that is saying is there's lots of ways to connect things to the internet, uh, lots of ways to get, get things into, let's call it, the cloud. Uh, but, oh, there's this big gap in the middle um, where we need some, some brokerage. Some, I need to be able to find things. I need to be able to arbitrate, ar arbitrate and see whether I'm allowed to connect to that thing. Is it willing to share data with me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's what we call the IOTIC space. That's the place where where uh, I'm playing and I'm interested now. I've done mobile phones for 25 years plus now. I think this uh, is, is the real new exciting area of wireless. It uses wireless. Uh, it probably wouldn't work without wireless. Uh, we need new wireless standards, but actually it's not really about wireless now. It's actually about in, not so much connecting, but interconnecting uh, things together. And then you start to think about, well, okay, what are some of the other issues there? Now how about, let's say I've now got a load of autonomous software 
agents that are, are doing the equivalent of my horticultural expert that have some knowledge and expertise, can make decisions, can uh, bring benefit. Um, they might want to go out there and, and find data that is relevant to the tasks that they're trying to solve at the moment. Um, so you need to find it. Uh, you need to, so we, we can just search on, the, on, on Google, can't we? Uh, but we need, we need approaches where computers can find relevant uh, information. So semantic web, for me, is, is a really important part of that, which, which allows computers to interpret the meaning of information. Um, maybe now, actually, well, there's lots of good open data out there that governments maybe are making available, but there's going to be data out there. If it's valuable, I'm going to want to charge you for it, aren't I? So uh, maybe now there's, there's a co contractual arrangement. I guess I'll share my data with you uh, for, for the purpose that you want. You only want it for 10 milliseconds. Uh, OK, I'll give you a price for that. Um, if you've ever worked with lawyers, you know they don't move terribly fast. So if you had to sign a contract, if you had to get a legal agreement in place, every time you wanted to do that, it would never work. So, the op so, one, so one of the issues that arises here is uh, what I really want is a machine that can go and find relevant information to help it fulfill its task, uh, know the providence of that data, that it's not made up data, but it actually it's, it's real reliable uh, weather data. Uh, it may need to uh, figure out what the legal terms of use are for that data um, and agree a contract, uh, and, and maybe there needs to be an exchange of money. So there's a whole bunch of different issues that this is beginning to, to raise up now. So well, I thought I was just talking about connecting my shoes to the internet. Oh, you can see already uh, how, how um, the, the space has expanded effectively in terms of, of the, the problem space, if I can put it that way. But if you think more about the opportunity space in terms of impacting services and how we live as, as humans, that continues to be the thing that excites me. I'll check how I'm doing for time. I feel like I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed up a bit. Um, so, so I just want to make two observations, and then I just want to say, in my mind, there are three uh, research areas that kind of coalesce uh, around this. The first is that what everybody's doing today is, storing, is collecting more and more data, storing it in more and more big data silos, doing lots of big data, data analytics on it, which is all very well, um, but they're not sharing it with anybody else. So actually, if you're running an organization uh, how many organizations don't have any partners or suppliers? Mm, can't think of one, really. Um, so actually what you find is, is that, as, let's take it as an organization, actually your, your, your partners, suppliers, customers even, have got bits of data that actually are relevant to you providing your, your goods or services. Um, so actually what we need to do is to begin to open up ways of, in a controlled way, a safe way, et cetera, uh, sharing that data between us. So data sharing take that away to data sharing in a safe way. Um, here's, here's another issue which, ah, lots of creative minds, brilliant minds in this room. Um, if we're going to make everything internet enabled, um, what's my interface for controlling my shoes or, or, or what's the user interface? I don't know. Um, well, <laughs> I don't want it to have a smart screen. I, I don't want it to have a touch screen on it. Um, that'd be a bit inconvenient. Um, so we really radically need to think about, and I don't really want to get the app, my phone out either, which is the other answer, isn't it? And uh, unlock my screen and find the app and tap on the app uh, and say, automatically type my shoelaces, please. No, that's, that's too hard. So there's a whole set of issues, I think, uh, moving forward around how we, how, we, um, how we do all the clever things we can do with computing increasingly, uh, but how we make it kind of more behind the scenes. Um, and, and I don't want a touch screen on, on everything that I'm going to connect. So this is a really important issue to fix. This is really important. Okay? So wonderful opportunities. Uh, it's going to be hell if uh, I need to put a touch screen on, on every object that's connected to the internet. So I thought of the most wacky thing I could think of, so tea bag. So one day, my tea bag will be connected to the internet somehow. I don't know. It might have a, a little wireless module in that, in that green, green thing at the end. Yeah. Maybe it changes colour when my tea's ready. Uh, maybe it learns uh, how long I like my tea to be brewed for, so it only changes colour when it's, it's the right strength for me. Well, that would be cool, wouldn't it? It had to be connected to the internet to do that. You'd need a machine learning system to do that. Uh, um, so you can see already, well, you know, I need a different user interface uh, in order to achieve something like that. Uh, there's a guy called David Rose at uh, MIT uh, Labs, 
uh, and, and he's talking about enchanted objects, and he's taking inspiration from the world of fant fantasy stories, like Lord of the Rings and, and Harry Potter. Uh, and one example I read was, uh, if any of you know Lord of the Rings, there's a, there's a sword that Bilbo Baggins has, which is, I forgot the name of it now, St Stinger or something, isn't it? Um, uh, and it kind of glows blue when there's dangerous orcs nearby, okay? So that's an example of an enchanted object. It, 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 it has a user experience that, that's based on knowing something, however it knows it. So in the computing world, my assertion is, is, that, is that we need more of these what are called enchanted objects. And that leads to sometimes called pervasive computing. Uh, invisible computing is, is, is a term I picked up more recently. And I really like this quotation. I'd like, to, I'd like you to challenge you with this. In appearance, the future will seem like the pre-computer past. Computers will merge with the background and eventually seem to cease to exist. It doesn't mean they're not there. It doesn't mean they're not doing even more amazing things than they do today. But let's push them into the background a bit. Now, what are the research issues that, that, that arise out of that issue? How are we doing on time? I, I'm about there. Yeah. I'm about there. Brilliant. Right. Okay. So watch is glowing up blue. Right. Okay. Orcs, orcs are near. Right. Orcs are near. Right. So I'll, I'll just leave you with this. Um, three key areas, then, in my mind, that are... Uh, active, but you know, I want to encourage you to say these are really exciting areas to get involved with, with a thing that's going to be bigger than humanity. So the one is this invisible computing area that I've, I've just, just referred to. Um, let's do clever stuff, but, but do it more invisibly. That's really hard to do, really hard to do. Supposedly Apple make really easy to use products. They do that by doing lots and lots of clever stuff behind the scenes, so it seems easy to use. Um, yeah, AI and autonomous systems, we, we, we need that. But what happens when they get it wrong? What about the 1% of times when they can't make the right decision or make the wrong decision? How do we deal with that? There's a whole bunch of issues there. And finally, I'm at loads of events like this where everybody goes, oh, privacy, oh, trust, security, it's dreadful. I can hack into cars and all kinds of things. Guys, we need to fix that. We need to do better. There's a massive area here that we need to get right in order to make the vision of humanity a more positive one uh, than, than this allows. And finally, final slide. Come and, come and join Cambridge Wireless. We talk about all kinds of things, not just wireless communication standards, however important they are, but everything really to do with the future of tech. Thank you.